So PCBUs, okay? Um, usually a, uh, a PCBU, the term P, person, for the context of a PCBU is the corporate body, not an actual person. Are we clear? The one exception is the self-employed. They are a PCBU, and because there's only one of them, they are the person. Okay? So it includes non-profit organisations. So SiteSafe is a not-for-profit organisation, but we are an undertaking. So we have the same duties as a commercial organisation. School, school boards? School boards, interesting one. So um, a school is an undertaking. The law fully covers them. Um, the board will get to when we get to offices. Okay, because um, that, that they, the PCBU is the school. The board ha contains the offices. And I'll, I'll cover the, the, both the duties and what it actually means to be. Um, how many of you sit on uh, community boards, school boards, things like that? That's usually the person who asks the questions here. <laughs> so you mentioned three million dollars. I'm really interested. I'll, I'll be able to give you some relief on that one. Okay. So this is pretty well the graphic of what it looks like. Um, by the way, in case I forget, because it's just sprung into my head now, over here on the table there's some booklets uh, giving all the information that's in this. I usually put them out on the seats, but I've got lazy today because I've already done one seminar this morning. Okay. So typically it's, it's kind of a clean model of a construction site, but the fence goes up around it. Within that we have the client, we have the principal contract, we have subcontractors. They're all PCBUs and as I said, they've got to consult, coordinate, cooperate together. Um, they also have the workers which quite frankly shouldn't sit outside the fence, they should be inside the fence, but they must be consulted and engaged with. So opportunities for that to happen must happen. That's the simple model we have now. Okay. Now, the reality of the model is, is that the principal contractor will have a lot of subcontractors, and some of them will have subcontractors, and some of them will have subcontractors here. So Hawkins Construction will bring in a, um, a painting firm who bring in a scaffolding firm, and so on. So now, rather than it being a uh, chain of command, it's a group responsibility to ensure that the scaffolders who come in are all safe. Okay. The way that is done can still continue it as, as it has done in that it's around planning the work well and ensuring communication takes place. So this is some of the detail around the responsibilities um, and as I said if I relate this back to the, um, the old legislation primary duties, they, they, the, we used to have a term all practicable steps does that sound familiar to some of you? Must take all practicable steps. Um, which under the old legislation means you needed to do w what was reasonable to achieve a result. And that term reasonable. Well they've brought the reasonable out of the definition now and, and it's right in the actual duty which is in so far as reasonably practicable. So those of you who are thinking what you have to alter in your health and safety manuals, you're going to have to uh, search and replace reasonably practicable with, uh, sorry, all practicable steps with reasonably practicable steps. Here's one, your first huge change, right? So. Let's look at some of the others. So, provide a safe working environment. That was required under the old one. Safe plant systems, safe uh, uh, handling of chemicals, the welfare of workers monitoring of health and, and safety. So if you had all this in place already for the old legislation, you've, you're good. You've got no worries. Um, the change is you now need to coordinate, cooperate and consult with other parties who have those duties to your workers if you're the employer-employee relationship. Okay, and that's going to include all these designers, manufacturers, importers, suppliers. So there are a lot of other parties now who we might not have traditionally considered connected with a construction project, but they are and they have a duty now. <coughs> And the, the, the apportionment of the duty is related to the amount of influence you have. Okay, and I'd love to give you a pie chart to show exactly what that is, but that will be uh, unique to every individual situation that shows up. Okay, 
Um, the manufacturer of safety harnesses, for instance, probably has the most influence around the quality of those harnesses, yes? The person who acquires that safety harnesses and passes it on has some duties around making sure that that has been done, that it has been manufactured to a standard and that the workers receiving it are trained and competent to use it. Then the workers receive a duty of making sure they use it properly. The workers also have a duty to say, I haven't been trained and I'm not competent, I'm not using it. You with me on this one? Yes. Okay. Nice and simple. Okay. Project managers come into the upstream Yes, um, project, project managers are, but they're not officers. <coughs> Okay, um, and we that one was one of the first very early on we sorted that one out um, and you'll see when we get to offices that, that, that it's definitely people very high up in the organisation um, and I'll, I'll give you the terms which cover that. So to all intents and purposes um, uh, project managers are workers. But the it could be offices within a project management organisation. <laughs> yes, <coughs> yep, but we'll cover who they are when we get that, but I don't want to steal my own thunder. Okay. So safety by design is about thinking about the risks that are going to be created both in the construction of a project and the ongoing use of a project. And if we look at uh, trends and even some regulations out of places like the UK, uh, designers over there are required to th even think about how is this uh, structure or uh, whatever it is I'm designing going to be decommissioned and or demolished. So it's a cradle to grave approach. So in the UK they actually have um, CDM, which is the Construction and Management Design Regulations, which puts a legal duty. In New Zealand we're going to adopt this under the broader uh, cover of the Health and Safety at Work Act. And it basically has really come back to those simple terms. Are you creating or potentially creating any risks? What can you do about it at the design stage? Officers. <laughs> okay, so the first thing that happened when the term officer was coined, every safety person in the, the country went, I'm resigning. <laughs> I'm not taking this on board. So here's, here's the key one for you to take away around officers. You are not deemed to be an officer unless you are, um, have significant influence at a governance level and it must be significant influence at a governance level. So we're talking about um, people sitting on boards, directors, we're talking about chief executives, potentially, and I'm only saying this because of, of what I've seen of Australian case law, chief financial officers, not all of them, some of them are basically accountants, yes? They don't have any influence over the actual direction or the policy of an organisation, they keep the books. Other chief financial officers do have significant influence over the governance of an organisation. Okay? The self-employed are officers, because by default they're the only one that has any influence over their PCBU, which they are individually anyway. You know what else for the um, self-employed? They are also the worker. So of all the people in the uh, workplace, under this new legislation, the self-employed got the widest range of duties. The good news is, is that they don't have to do three separate sets of duties. Yeah. So if you're self-employed, you take reasonable care, you ensure that your business is putting reasonably practicable steps in place, you've pretty well taken care of your duties as an officer. So when it comes to these duties of officers, the intent was to really aim at um, the chief people in an organisation and particularly uh, directors on boards and it's requiring them to ask the same questions now about health and safety within their organisation, their PCBU, as they have traditionally always asked about the finances. You, ask, you know where I'm coming from here? Financial reports go in regularly to boards of directors. They are very concerned about making sure that we are performing at our utmost level, yes? They now need to take that approach to health and safety. And they've been set some specific duties which we'll have a look at. So now, voluntary boards. Okay, 
we have a situation under this new legislation where if you are on if you're on a board and this includes government groups school boards volunteer boards for community groups those sorts of things you have a duty you have officers duties but for all those ones they exempted you from penalties so you cannot be prosecuted for failing to meet those duties is that solely because it's an unpaid role? It's, um, yes, yes, that's probably a good way of looking at it. Um, I, I, think it I think there's a deeper philosophy here. I think they recognise the fact that people who volunteer for community, good, we don't want to put them off. But they didn't exempt me from it, so it's, it's a weird one. It took me a while to get my head around this. So if you're on a, 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 a school board as a trustee, you have the duties of an officer, but you cannot be prosecuted. You're specifically exempted, and I think it's section 47 of the new Act goes through and says none of these people who volunteer. So they're only looking at people who are in paid positions. Does it also apply for non uh, for non paid positions inside uh, non for profit? Um, as a worker. As a volunteer. As a volunteer, yeah, volunteers have some exemptions as well. Okay. Yeah. So, because now the PCBU you volunteer for doesn't. Okay, but um, we're finding them. Po I, I, I had a conversation very recently. Wellington, it was. I've been all over New Zealand lately, um, and the guy organises um, charity events. So um, he was there because uh, it was a workplace thing, but he says, I've got this other thing I do, we organise. There's about 30 of us and we've got kind of this loose committee and we organise these sporting events for um, underprivileged kids. I thought, that's great. So um, they are an undertaking, but those people as the organisers and officers are exempt from being prosecuted, they are not exempt from the duties. So we good? Excellent. I'll tell you who is an officer at the school, the principal. Because they, they have to appoint the principal as an officer? No, they, they, already, have that, they already have that duty. Because does, does the school principal have major influence over the running of the school? Yeah. Okay, so straight away, officer. And are they volunteering or, or un, uh, paid? And the answer is yes, so boom, they are now there. Um, you know, SiteSafe is a good example. We have a board of eight directors and a chief executive. The chief executive is an officer. She's in a paid position. One of our board members is also a professional director who's paid to be on our board, so they have the duties and the liabilities of an officer. The other seven directors on our board <coughs> are all volunteers from the construction industry in one shape or another and they have the duties but they are not liable for those duties. So although on paper we have nine officers, we only have two that are liable and seven that are, have the duties but are not liable. Does that make sense to everyone? Okay. Um, if you ha leave here with any doubts, uh, get in touch with us, we'll call WorkSafe. Um, there's a very good uh, guideline around you can download this from WorkSafe's website, I did, um, <coughs> Introduction to the Health and Safety at Work Act 2015, so it actually goes into a lot of detail around some of these things and gives some clarity. Okay, And if you're still wondering after you get that, then yeah, definitely ring someone and have a chat. So just to clarify, the school itself is not exempt, the principal... Nope. Isn't. So the school, yeah, the, the, the undertaking, school PCBU, yep. Yep. It's the, PCBU. the principal himself is not exempt or he is exempt? No one's exempt from the duties, but... Uh, but prosecution, the prosecution. Yep, yep. The, the, the principal is not exempt. But the trustees are. Yep. As long as they're unpaid. Yeah. Some schools actually, like sites, they have a paid director on their board, yeah. someone professional, um, and they... But it's so if you're a volunteer on a community school um, and there's some government groups that are exempt as well, uh, then, then you're exempt from prosecution but not from the duties. I, I guess, and I had a talk with a senior WorkSafe official on this, and they said, look, the, the intent was is we want everyone to actually do, their, do what's right. But we also realise that we don't want to put people off doing these things because it's hard enough to get volunteers for these things. Yeah? Right, so 
Let's relate this back to um, a major company who has branches all over New Zealand um, and the chief executive and the board reside in an ivory tower just off Queen Street in <coughs> Auckland. You got the picture? They need to keep up to date with their work health and safety matters. So for these directors, that's probably going to mean a little bit of professional development each year. Actually go and attend a seminar or two on, on what it means. So you, to, to fulfill your duties, you're going to have to understand at least the basics of, of, of what the Health and Safety at Work Act requires, yes? They also need to get an understanding of all the risks and stuff that are within their organisation. <coughs> Once again, technically this is the self-employed person. Do you think a self-employed person is inherently familiar with the risks that he faces? Okay, so as a carpenter, whereas someone run, running a major construction company, a lot of these companies are not run by carpenters, they're run by business people, but they now need to have an understanding of what are the basic risks in my organisation. They also need to get some assurance that those risks are being managed. So chief executives do not need to go out and do audits on every one of their work sites or their workplaces. They need to make sure that is being done though, yes? So this is what we talk about due diligence I don't need to get a carpenter's license, but I run a building company, I do need to understand what the risks are. I need to understand are they being managed, do we have systems in place, I need to have some reports back. And this relates back to what I was saying earlier about this is doing the same due diligence as they currently do for their financial performance. Do you think that the chief executives get together or the board of directors get together once a year and go, are we making any money? <laughs> They keep their finger on that pulse continuously. Well, they're being asked to keep their finger on the health and safety pulse continuously now as well. Okay? Right. Any questions around that? Cool. So, I've covered that one. Let's deal with the workers, because it's about a third to a half of the room, I believe.